the study of uh, uh, of distant distant galaxies and quasars using both the gas and dust uh, uh, the studies of quasar host galaxies uh, at these very high redshifts. From there, he got an ESO fellowship, and he was really very much involved in in what was the commission of, of Alma of the first years of Alma. Just to give a, as a detail, at the time he arrived to 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 the to Chile, Alma has only three telescopes working, but at the time he was living 32 were already uh, running in the interferometer. Then he, he got really a very large experience with all the commissioning of, of ALMA. Okay, and after that, in the fourth year, you know that when you have an ESO fellowship, you have the fourth year and you can choose the the, uh, the institute in which you are going to, to work and he moved to to the Cavendish in, in, in Cambridge in UK. And from there he moved to to, uh, SK, to the SKA headquarters, to the SKA office, where he has been working at the, at the science office of the, uh, in, in SKA. And in fact, he has done there a very, uh, really, I, I would say, a, a great job. Because, uh, of course, he has been just yes, the coordinator, of, yes, the liaison, he has been the liaison within the scientific, uh, with the, within the science science group of the SKIO, he has been the liaison for four of the scientific working groups, but also he has been also the coordinator of the community uh, for three of the uh, engineering design consortia. This is very important because they are playing this, the, the connection between what the astronomers want to do with SKA and the real life that the, peop, uh, that the instrument can do. And in fact, this, this contact with the, with the different engineering consortia has been very relevant. Of course, it has been given talks in many uh, institutes around the world explaining uh, what's SKA and, and, and really uh, fostering and really and triggering the, the entrance of new countries and, and new scientists within the, the SKA world. And in fact, for example, he was co-organizing co together with our institute the, the SKA station at the IWAS in Tenerife some, some few years ago. Okay, today he is going to give us a, a presentation about the, the road to the square kilometer array. And I am sure it's going to be a, a very interesting talk for all of us. Then, Jeff, welcome to, to the institute. And we are ready to look. Um, phone is on? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, all right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, I am going to give you an update uh, on the square kilometer and some of the design work. I think um, most of you uh, will be aware that the SKA is being built in two phases, uh, where the first phase will consist of two telescopes, those shown here. Uh, in Western Australia, we uh, expect uh, to deploy a large number of these log periodic dipole antennas in what's called SK1 low. And in the career of South Africa, we'll be building out these mid to high frequency dishes, uh, which we call uh, SK1 mid. So toward the end of the talk, <coughs> I'll give you an update on what these telescopes will look like. And some of the uh, design efforts uh, that have gone into building, or that will go into building uh, those facilities. Um, for the talk, I wanted to start by motivating the reason for building uh, these telescopes. In fact, all uh, low frequency to mid uh, frequency uh, observatories, we're really entering a golden era for radio astronomy. There are a number of new facilities, even before the SKs come online, uh, that will be adding to our knowledge of not only fundamental physics, but also the formation and evolution of some of the first galaxies. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in the first half of the talk. <clears throat> now, you'll often hear these terms SK pathfinders uh, and SK precursors. Uh, the precursors are any telescope uh, that are currently in operation on the two sites in Western Australia uh, and South Africa, whereas pathfinders are those SK telescopes whose technology can help us better optimize and understand what design choices should be made uh, for the SK. So I'll give you a brief overview of what those pathfinders and precursors are and some of the science uh, that's already emerging uh, from those facilities. Uh, finally, I'll, I'll close by uh, describing some of the activities, some of the design work uh, that we've been undertaking, and ways in which uh, the multi-waveline community can get involved uh, in preparing uh, for the SK, specifically uh, in this area of SK data challenges. And so uh, we're aiming these data challenges not just on the radio, at, towards radio astronomers, uh, but specifically uh, to the broader um, community. So <clears throat> Personally, one of the things that's been most exciting for me about working on this project has been to watch the growth of interest from the broader scientific community. Uh, when we started uh, five and a half years ago, there were less than 200 members of the 11 science working groups and two focus groups, uh, which are listed here. 
As of last week, there are nearly 800 members of these groups. And so I think that's really a testament to the broader interest in the SK, but also the efforts of some of our chairs, people like Lourdes, who've done an excellent effort uh, in going out and engaging uh, with the broader community, as well as helping us uh, constrain the scientific uh, requirements for SK1 low and SK1 mid. And I'll sh show you a little bit about how that works uh, toward the end. A big effort also went into updating the science case for the SK. I see many of the authors are sitting in this room, so that's great. Uh, 2,000 pages uh, weighing in at nine kilos. I think uh, for those of you uh, who are interested, you can download uh, any of these chapters for free off of the website. Um, in the interest of time, I obviously won't be able to cover all of the science uh, that's contained in this book. I just want to focus on a few areas. Uh, some of these might be familiar to the experts uh, in the room, but others hopefully uh, will be something uh, that you haven't seen before. Uh, so beginning with pulsars, uh, pulsars and the way that we can use pulsars uh, to test uh, general relativity. I think um, for the radio astronomers in the room, uh, you'll be aware that pulsars are neutron stars which are effectively acting as cosmic lighthouses uh, in our own Milky Way galaxy. Uh, for the known pulsar population, the typical masses are about 1.4 uh, solar masses. Um, they have very strong magnetic fields which give rise to synchrotron uh, radiation. Therefore, when they spin at rates anywhere between about one millisecond to up to upwards of 10 seconds for the known pulsar population, we see these as effectively, again, cosmic lighthouses beaming uh, infrequently uh, toward our position here on the Earth. Now, um, with SK1 low and SK1 mid, the current plan is to use these telescopes to survey for pulsars both above and below uh, the galactic plane. The way that would work is SK1 mid uh, would be used to survey the galactic plane at higher frequencies to overcome the effects of scattering in order to increase uh, the number of known pulsars. And the predictions, <coughs> as is shown here, is that we should increase uh, the number of known pulsars by roughly an order of magnitude. So that's important not only for increasing our knowledge of the pulsar luminosity function, it's also interesting because it can provide us with new and very interesting or rare pulsars uh, that can be used to test uh, general relativity. Uh, so what do I mean by that? So imagine if you have a pulsar in orbit or a millisecond pulsar in orbit around uh, the black hole, the supermassive black hole that we believe exists at the center of the Milky Way, then the rate at which its pulse changes as, a, as the pulsar falls into that black hole should be described by general relativity. So if we can find an object like this, that would be a great way to test general relativity uh, in the strong field regime. Uh, now there's another <coughs> experiment which is being used uh, to search for uh, direct evidence for gravitational waves. And this is the so-called pulsar uh, timing array experiment, which is looking for the so-called nanohertz gravitational wave extragalactic background. So this nanohertz gravitational wave background has been predicted to be due to the mergers of supermassive black holes uh, throughout the history of the universe. And what you should then see is if you have a small number of very well-behaved uh, millisecond pulsars, so those pulses uh, which, are, well, which change very little uh, as a function of time, then those nanohertz gravitational waves should imprint a signature on the residuals coming from uh, the timing of those pulsars. And so if you imagine if you find a subset of these, and in fact a few percent of the no millisecond pulsar population should be well enough behaved in terms of their period. Here's an example uh, where the period is known to 18 significant figures that, that shows these can be excellent astrophysical clocks. Um, a few percent of these will be well enough behaved that you can use these uh, for the pulsar timing array experiment. And so by timing these and looking in different regions of the sky, you should see a correlation function, an angular correlation function that looks something like this. This was predicted by Hellings and Downs back in the early 80s. And the current pulsar timing array experiments with telescopes like Parkes and the Green Bank Telescope are looking to make the first detection of this. Now if they don't, um, SK phase one, and specifically SK phase one mid at higher frequencies, should make this first discovery, and we know these gravitational waves are out there and they can be detected. The higher frequency uh, neutron star, neutron star merger gravitational waves have been detected in the last few years uh, by LIGO. And so the, what the SK will contribute to this field is the ability to detect uh, smaller, fainter and more numerous of these millisecond pulsars in order to, again, uh, provide better constraints or direct detections of the nanohertz gravitational wave background. So I think, um, I think it's fair to say that there's probably one, maybe two Nobel Prizes left in the study of pulsars uh, that can be made with the SK even in the first phase uh, of the uh, telescope. So that's very exciting. Um, going out beyond our own Milky Way galaxy, I think 
Many of you will be aware that uh, the studies of the 21 centimeter line in nearby galaxies uh, is an excellent way both to probe the kinematic properties of galaxies as well as measuring uh, their H1 mass uh, column densities. Now what's interesting is one of the very first uh, science cases that was, that was put forward uh, for building a square kilometer of collecting area at low radio frequencies was that was the calculation or of the area that one would need to be able to study this faint 21 centimeter emission in normal, say, M-star type galaxies out to significant uh, cosmological distances, say, redshifts of about two. Um, now, we are not planning to build a square kilometer of collecting area uh, in the first phase of the SK. In fact, SK1 mid is less than 10% or will be less than 10% of a square kilometer. However, uh, we will have a significant uh, mapping speed as well as sensitivity in order to detect H1 line emission in large numbers of galaxies out to redshifts beyond redshifts of one. And I'll come back to that here uh, in a couple of slides. So Lourdes and others uh, in, the, in the Institute are experts, uh, more experts obviously than myself, in the study of H1 line emission in nearby galaxies. I just wanted to, to point out a few areas where SK1 MIDS uh, in particular can be an excellent tool uh, for studying the H1 line emission in nearby galaxies. Galaxies at distances less than roughly 10 megaparsecs uh, like M83. So typically we make uh, with H1 or with uh, instruments like the Very Large Array, uh, the Westerbork Telescope in the Netherlands, we make images like the ones here in the middle and on the right of nearby galaxies in H1, typically probing the highest column density gas in the ISM, 10 to the 19th atoms per centimeter squared and higher. However, the hydrodynamic simulations, uh, like the one shown here and on the right, these are hydrodynamic simulations by Yelp Shea and collaborators at Leiden, predict that there should be low column density gas streaming out of the surrounding intergalactic medium, feeding future episodes of star formation activity in the ISM of these galaxies. And so images like this, these are obviously simulations, but in the future, using SK1 mid, uh, the working group has predicted that about 300 hours of integration would allow you to make a map of similar quality of galaxies like M83 at distances less than roughly 10 megaparsecs. So one would need to smooth these maps to roughly half an arc minute and combine those uh, with the single dish observations, which provide you with the largest uh, angular scale emission. But again, it'd be an excellent way to view galaxy formation as it's actually happening in uh, the nearby universe. Um, now, as I mentioned before, having high mapping speed and sensitivity allows you to detect H1 line emission in large numbers of galaxies out to significant cosmological distances. And just to put things in context, uh, the highest redshift to which we can currently detect H1 line emission is about redshift 0 0.4. Uh, this is a, a galaxy in the Chile survey, a gas-rich galaxy uh, in the Chile survey with a very large array uh, of the cosmos field. Uh, the H1 Science Working Group, using a non-evolving H1 mass function, have made predictions for the number densities of galaxies we might expect to detect in nominal, in this case, uh, 10,000 hour surveys uh, <laughs> using SK1 mid. That sounds like a lot of time, but it'll come back to at the end, we expect to devote a large amount of time with SK1 mid, as well as SK1 low to these large uh, survey programs. Uh, now their surveys have assumed uh, multiple tiers, as is often the case with these extra galactic surveys, you wanna do a wide uh, shallow tier uh, at the, the, the shallowest depth, and then a very narrow pencil beam uh, survey uh, covering a smaller area to get those galaxies, to detect those galaxies uh, out to higher redshifts. And so the current samples of H1 line emitters uh, with surveys like alfalfa detect a few 10,000 uh, of H1 line emitters in the nearby universe. Surveys like this, even in the first phase of the SK, uh, could be sensitive to on the order of 10 million galaxies over, in this case, roughly 20,000 square degrees, while the pencil beam surveys could be sensitive uh, to galaxies all the way up to just beyond uh, redshifts of one. And so surveys like this would be useful not only for measuring the kinematics of galaxies and their H1 mass or their H1 gas content, but also to measure um, the H1 mass function as a function of redshift and in different environments, something that Lourdes and Mike uh, have been very active uh, in working on. Uh, so very exciting. Uh, in addition to the, to the H1 atomic gas uh, content in galaxies, uh, we also get for free the radio continuum emission at low frequencies. Now, most of us are used to seeing these beautiful pictures of, of radio galaxies, radio loud quasars that we observe uh, because of the synchrotron emission from these objects at low radio frequencies below uh, roughly 1.4 gigahertz, which is what you would obtain with the, um, in, in parallel uh, with the 21 centimeter observations. But the predictions of the H1, or sorry, the continuum uh, science working group is that when we reach the depths of some of the deepest 
uh, band 2 survey, so L-band or 1.4 gigahertz surveys uh, with, um, with the SK-1 mid telescope, we should be sampling predominantly the star-forming galaxy population. So that radio emission you see should be telling you about the obscured star formation in the ISM of these galaxies. So remember, at optical infrared wavelengths, we might be missing a significant amount of star formation at high redshift that we can only pick up by observing objects at radio or far infrared submillimeter uh, wavelengths. So in the future, wide field surveys with band two, covering, in this case, up to 20,000 square degrees, could be sensitive to star formation rates of a few tens of solar masses per year, all the way out to redshifts of six and beyond, so into the epoch of reionization. If you were to combine those observations with multi-wavelength uh, observations with the large survey synoptic telescope in Euclid, one obtains a photometric redshift, and combined, that gives you an estimate of the obscured star formation rate of the universe uh, as a function of redshift again, from the local universe all the way out uh, to beyond redshift of six. Uh, another interesting uh, possibility is to observe these deep fields at higher uh, frequencies. At rest frame frequencies of 30 gigahertz and above, you start to become sensitive in the local universe to thermal free free emission from galaxies, which again, might provide a, a direct estimate of the star formation rate in the ISM of galaxies as it's tracing uh, the H2, uh, H2 regions where star formation is taking place. In practice, this is a very difficult uh, measurement to make. For those of you who have tried to do this, uh, what happens is the free free emission uh, is in wavelength space is just between uh, your lower frequency synchrotron and your higher frequency far infrared. So you need to have very high angular resolution as well as a very well sampled uh, spectral energy di distribution for your galaxies. Uh, with SK-1 mids, we'll have about uh, 40 milliarc second resolution uh, with band 5, which is the 10 to 15 gigahertz window. So that 30 gigahertz free free gets redshifted down to this window for galaxies beyond redshifts of about two. Uh, so the, the working group, in this case the continued working group, have predicted uh, that we should be able to use uh, these high frequency uh, surveys of extragalactic D fields to in fact probe directly that thermal free free emission. And this plot here is just showing you the expected star formation rate sensitivity at five sigma as a function of redshift. And you see if there are very high star formation rate galaxies out to redshift of 10, we should be able to detect those in these very deep pencil beam surveys uh, with SK-1 mid at band 5. Uh, this is uh, obviously much more sensitive than some of the wider field surveys that are being done with a very large array. Comparable in sensitivity to what ALMA can achieve now through the far infrared emission. Remember, ALMA is observing the dust emission from galaxies where that dust is reprocessing ongoing star formation uh, activity uh, from the UV photons of O and B type stars. However, ALMA is effectively a microscope. The largest surveys uh, that we're currently conducting now of our extragalactic deep fields cover a few hundred square arc minutes at most. In the future with the SK, we'll be able to cover many square degrees, up to 20,000 square degrees for the lower frequency uh, survey. So that'll be important because it will allow us to overcome uh, the effects of what's called cosmic variance due to very small uh, sample volumes. Okay, so at the higher frequencies, um, the other aspect of these deep field surveys is that one would be able to uh, probe uh, the cold molecular gas in the ISM of high redshift galaxies using lines like mole uh, molecular carbon monoxide. Uh, for those of you who work uh, on star formation, you know that for extragalactic sources, uh, one of the most effective means we have of tracing uh, the cold molecular gas fuel that's driving star, star formation in the ISM is through these low J lines of uh, molecular CO, which has rotational transitions occurring at frequency spacings of 115 gigahertz. Um, there are some challenges there. You have to assume a CO to H2 conversion factor to estimate your cold molecular gas mass. Uh, that's something we won't cover here today. But um, I think we're starting to overcome these uh, challenges, uh, overcome these uncertainties uh, from some of the modeling that's been done in recent years. Another challenge to observing the low JCO lines is that at high redshift, these lines are very faint. In fact, typically much fainter than the higher J transitions uh, that we observe redshifted to millimeter and submillimeter wavelengths. And so in fact, that may have introduced a bias in our understanding of molecular gas at high redshift. Uh, this is illustrated here by this sample of CO line uh, spectral energy distributions. So these are multiple J transitions in different galaxies, star forming galaxies, quasar host <laughs> galaxies uh, at high redshift compared to the Milky Way. And so what you see is that most galaxies tend to have this very warm interstellar medium, which gives rise to very strong emission in the high J, higher energy 
uh, CO lines, telling you that the gas is at temperatures of a few tens of Kelvin uh, densities, 10 to the fourth, maybe 10 to the fifth atoms per centimeter square. This is very different uh, than what we see in the Milky Way, which has a, a turnover uh, in the CO line SED, which occurs at maybe right, um, the four to three or the three to two transition. So the implication of this is if you were to go out with a telescope like ALMA and make an observation at one millimeter, uh, you'd typically be uh, surveying these higher J lines. You might be missing cold galaxies at high redshift that you could only see if you were to observe uh, the lower J tra transitions at centimeter uh, wavelengths. Unfortunately, even with the very large array, we're sensitivity limited to observing lines uh, like one to zero of CO and in fact uh, other dense gas tracers like HCN uh, and CS. And so we need an increase in sensitivity that the SK1 mid uh, telescope should be able to provide and possibly if uh, the frequency uh, is extended up beyond 20 gigahertz, uh, we should be able to resurrect uh, some of these deep field surveys of the low J transitions. This is something we looked at uh, in our SK uh, science book chapter back in 2015 uh, using the semi-analytic models of Elisabetta de Cunha, uh, who's now in Australia. Uh, we made predictions for what a, a high frequency deep field survey uh, would see in terms of molecular gas uh, line emitters through the CO line or some of the dense gas tracers like HCN or CS. Uh, for those of you who work on star formation, you'll know that the uh, lines like HCN typically trace much denser gas uh, than the CO lines, densities of around 10 to the fifth atoms per centimeter squared. But the line emission is about an order of magnitude fainter than the, tip the corresponding line of CO. And so imagine if it takes 10 hours to detect CO, it's going to take uh, 1, or 100 hours to detect the HCN with the, even your largest radio wavelength telescope. So for that reason, lines like HCN are only observed in some of the most extreme gravitationally lensed uh, star forming galaxies in AGN at high redshift. But in the future, with the SK-1 mid telescope, if it were to work up to frequencies beyond 20 gigahertz, which is what I'll come back to uh, in a few slides, we should be able to make uh, images like the one shown here. This is a CO2 to 1 line image of a galaxy in the Goods North field. This is GN20, uh, an image of uh, CO2 to 1. We should make, be able to make comparable quality images of the low J dense gas tracers like HCN uh, in reasonable integration times uh, using SK1. Uh, mid. So again, resurrecting the ability to observe dense gas tracers in high redshift galaxies, uh, similar to what, how we're observing the CO lines uh, right now. Now, I just wanted to cover one uh, final example of one of the science cases, not only for SK1 low, but also for most of the low-frequency uh, facilities that are currently operating at meter uh, wavelengths. And in fact, one of the iconic science cases that has always <coughs> existed for the SK is to, has been to use that redshifted 21 centimeter line, both in emission and absorption, this time associated not with individual galaxies, but rather with uh, the intervening intergalactic medium, into the epoch of reionization and further back into what is uh, referred to as uh, the cosmic dawn approaching the so-called dark ages. Um, now we have very good conditions, or very good uh, constraints, I'm sorry, on the initial conditions uh, for structure formation in the universe. Uh, thanks for all sky maps of the cosmic microwave background most recently obtained with the Planck satellite. However, very little is known about how that structure evolved uh, from the time uh, of the Big Bang through what's called the Cosmic Dark Ages, where no stars or galaxies yet really existed, through the cosmic dawn and into the epoch of reionization. Our high redshift galaxy surveys have detected galaxies all the way out to beyond redshifts of eight, maybe even nine. Yet, very little is known about this, this frequency range, or sorry, this redshift range, approaching the end of the Dark Ages, which is somewhere around Righteous of 27. This can be overcome through observations at low frequencies of the redshift to 21 centimeter line, uh, again, both in emission and absorption, which can tell us uh, when the universe emerged from the Dark Ages, how did the process, later process of cosmic ionization proceed, and maybe more importantly, what was the neutral fraction of the intergalactic medium as a function of redshift. So this is something you can't measure with your Lyman Alpha line, Lyman Alpha gets wiped out at these very high redshifts. And so the 21 centimeter line will allow us to again begin con to begin to constrain what that neutral fraction was at these very early uh, cosmic times. So here on the bottom right, uh, this is a model for what the all sky 21 centimeter signal associated with the intergalactic medium is expected to look like or expected to behave like as a function of frequency or redshift with respect to the background, cosmic microwave background. 
So think of this as being analogous to the all sky three Kelvin um, CMB black body spectrum uh, that we've measured now for many years. Only what this is telling you is the di temperature difference between that 21 centimeter signal uh, and the background uh, CMB at different times. So during the cosmic dark ages, what's happening is that the gas um, in the intergalactic medium is cooling adiabatically in that expanding universe. That cooling is taking place uh, faster than the CMB is cooling. That continues until the first UV photons uh, turn on. Those UV photons recouple the 21 centimeter uh, temperature to that which is closer to the CMB uh, through an effect called the Wellhausen field effect until the expansion takes over again. This is during the cosmic dawn. You see again another dip. At that point, the first X-ray sources turn on and begin to heat the gas uh, to a temperature above that of the CMB uh, for the first time in the history of the universe. And this is actually the period that people refer to as the epoch of ionization. So when people talk about the EOR, what they're talking about is a time when the gas temperature is actually higher than that of the CMB on average throughout the universe uh, for the first time. A uh, very exciting discovery was made uh, by the EDGES experiment in Western Australia. This was published uh, last year. What they uh, have detected is this dip during the cosmic dawn. And what's very interesting about that from a theoretical point of view is that the depth of that dip appears to be about a factor two stronger than most models uh, would have predicted. And so that has implications for us. SK1 low, as I'll show you here in a couple of slides, will make measurements of the power spectrum. And so if the temperature, the average temperature, uh, for some physical reason is a factor two uh, deeper than we would have expected, then that power spectrum, the effect on the power spectrum is squared. So that means we should ha see a factor of about four stronger signals. So that's very exciting. And it might mean that we might be able to see for the first time uh, the power spectrum of fluctuations uh, during the same frequency range. And so just to put a little more emphasis on that, what the SK1 low is actually aiming to measure as an interferometer is not the global 21 centimeter signal, but actually uh, fluctuations at different angular scales in the sky and at different frequencies or as a function uh, of redshift. Uh, this is something we've modeled or the theoreticians have modeled now uh, for many decades. Uh, this is a, a simulation at redshift eight showing you what we expect the universe to look like at this early time. You see it looks something like Swiss cheese where you have these big ionized regions which are growing uh, thanks to the UV photons and X-ray emission from early AGN star forming galaxies. These bubbles overlap until the universe uh, is completely or 99.9% .9 ionized. With the low frequency telescopes, what we expect or well, what we aim uh, to measure are uh, cubes like this at different frequencies or different redshifts and on different angular scales. Because within this uh, measurement, there's a wealth of information both about the sources that are ionizing the universe early on, uh, as well as uh, cosmological effects such as the density uh, of bari baryons here. Uh, it also, uh, the brightness temperature signal depends on the spin temperature, uh, which is set by radiative transitions, collisions, and as well as the so-called Wauthausen uh, field effect that I mentioned earlier. So again, what we would like to do ultimately is to make measurements uh, like this. However, as I'll come back to, there are calibration challenges uh, associated with making measurements like this. And so for the most part, um, existing facilities like MWA, uh, HERA, as well as low farm are looking to make the first measurements of the power spectrum of these 21 centimeter fluctuations during the epoch of reionization. So roughly between 100 and 200 megahertz. Now, most of these facilities, um, in order to do that, <coughs> the power we expect to see should be on a few arc minutes uh, to degree angular scales. So for that reason, most of these facilities um, have concentrated the collecting area of their interferometers into very uh, short spacings. Uh, the way an interferometer works is that the shorter the spacings, the larger the angular scales in the sky that you'll be sampling. And so with a, if you have very long baselines, that gives you the ability uh, to see very fine details. In the case of the EOR experiment, we want to have a lot of sensitivity on very short baselines to measure the large angular scales. We expect uh, to see the power spectrum measurements uh, of the 21 centimeter signal. So the SK is, is no different. In terms of SK1 low, we have about 40% of the collecting area contained uh, within the central one kilometer uh, diameter. However, we also have very long baselines in the case of SK1 low in order to characterize and remove uh, the EOR 21 centimeter foregrounds, which are interesting in their own right, the galactic and extragalactic foregrounds. Uh, but these can be a few orders of magnitude uh, greater than the signal we're trying to see 
uh, during the epoch of reionization. So these uh, need to be uh, characterized and then removed uh, from the EOR 21 centimeter maps. In addition, we also need to characterize and correct for the ionosphere. Those of you who observe at low frequencies know that the ionosphere poses a big challenge for us, but through direction-dependent effects, and from what we've learned from telescopes like LOFAR, I think this is something we'll be able to overcome by the time we start observing uh, with SK1 low. So the ultimate goal will be to make maps uh, like the one shown here. Uh, if you hear people talk about tomographic imaging of the EOR, this is what they're talking about. A three-dimensional movie of the evolution of this 21 centimeter brightness temperature signal as a function of time or redshift. Ultimately, from the end of the Dark Ages through to the end uh, of the reionization epoch, <coughs> somewhere around redshift, uh, just a little bit after redshift of six. The reason this is important is it not only tells us what the structure looks like, but we can cross correlate maps like this uh, with the positions of galaxies that will be detected in the future uh, with surveys like Euclid and JWST to see exactly how those galaxies in AGN are influencing the gas in the surrounding intergalactic uh, medium. So really iconic science, and provided we can overcome all the calibration challenges associated uh, with these low frequency measurements, something we would have enough sensitivity uh, to do using even uh, the first phase uh, of the SKA. So I think at this point I wanted to transition into some of the existing facilities that are aiming to make uh, measurements like this. Talk about some of the low frequency precursors and pathfinders uh, to the SK-1 uh, array. So on the Western Australia site, the first precursor uh, is shown here. This is the uh, Murchison Widefield Array, uh, the MWA, which has recently uh, been upgraded. Uh, it currently covers uh, from 80 uh, to 300 megahertz. So again, it's focusing on one of the main science cases being uh, the study of the power spectrum and 21 centimeter fluctuations uh, during the epoch of reionization. Uh, the collecting area has been increased are roughly a factor of two, as well as the maximum baselines on MWA have been extended out to six uh, kilometers. So that extension, that expansion is now complete. Because the baselines on, on the MWA are not yet long enough uh, to be able to identify all the, 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 the foreground uh, point sources in your 21 centimeter EOR map, facilities like the MWA and LOFAR, in fact, are using a technique called foreground avoidance rather than foreground uh, separation. So the way that works is you take a power spectrum of your map, and if you take a power spectrum in two dimensions, so in the plane of the sky and along the line of sight, what you see is that the foregrounds, uh, the galactic and extragalactic foregrounds, tend to sit preferentially in this region uh, called the wedge, so regions of effectively small spatial scales and large uh, frequency scales. If this is entirely correct, um, then making your power spectrum measurements in uh, the, the other regions in two-dimensional power space should provide you with a clean estimate of the 21 centimeter EOR power spectrum. However, there are some uncertainties. There's, there's still some debate as to, to how clean that window might actually be. So in the case of SK1 low, what we would like to do is what we, and what we plan to do are have, is to have baselines extending beyond uh, 50 kilometers to be able to properly characterize and then remove uh, these foregrounds entirely. Another experiment uh, facility, in fact, um, which is aiming to make the first measurements of the 21 centimeter, centimeter power spectrum, uh, specifically during the EOR uh, window, is HERA. Uh, this is shown here. Now, uh, one thing to pick up, one thing to notice right away, is that HERA has adopted a completely different uh, technical approach to detecting the 21 centimeter power spectrum signal compared uh, to LOFAR or the MWA. Uh, they're using dishes, and the idea here is that you, by focusing uh, where you're looking, uh, you avoid some of the side lobes which can influence or can come in uh, in your aperture rays, therefore for contaminating uh, your, your, your maps. They've also uh, adopted this redundant approach in the way that the antennas are separated. <clears throat> now the goal there is that you can increase your sensitivity for your power spectrum measurements on certain angular scales by having these redundant spacings. So imagine rather than having a, a, a randomized distribution, you're measuring the same angles in the sky uh, multiple times. Therefore, you don't have to deploy uh, as much collecting area. Now, here it is um, in the process of being completed. Uh, as of the end of March, they're planning to be able to correlate up to 50 of these antennas, probably more than 150 antennas uh, by the end of the year. In the end, I think there will be roughly 250 antennas uh, in the HERA array. So that's exciting. We should see some early results uh, coming from HERA. Uh, in the months ahead. 
Uh, now, as a final example, uh, the, the, probably the largest, in fact, well, it is the largest uh, low-frequency uh, telescope currently in operation will be familiar to those of you working on VLBI uh, and others, uh, is the LOFAR array. Now, LOFAR, <coughs> again, uses aperture array technology similar uh, to SK-1 low, and so for this reason, uh, we call uh, LOFAR an SK pathfinder. has a high concentration of collecting area uh, in the core region uh, within the <coughs> Netherlands, as well as these remote stations spread out uh, throughout Europe. I think the most recent station uh, was built uh, in Ireland. And these long stations provide you with the ability to do very long baseline interferometry to get high angular resolution, sub-arc second angular, re angular resolution of your low-frequency fields. So I'm, I'm not a betting individual, but I would say one of these three facilities, either the MWA, uh, LOFAR, or HERA, uh, will make the first measurement of the power spectrum of these 21 centimeter fluctuations uh, sometime in the next few years. And so what the SK-1 low will contribute to that is the ability to make uh, uh, confirm and, in fact, improve the errors on those power spectrum measurements, as well as to push those measurements down uh, to lower frequencies into the cosmic dawn. And ideally, if we can overcome the calibration challenges, to make the first tomographic maps of the 21 centimeter uh, signal. Uh, and I just want to cover a few other uh, high frequency pathfinders. In this case, those pathfinders in the northern hemisphere, which at work at frequencies mostly above uh, 1 gigahertz. The Very Large Array will be familiar to all the radio astronomers uh, in the room. One thing to note is the Very Large Array has really been one of the most productive uh, scientific uh, facilities, ground-based facilities of all time. It was built in the early 80s. Uh, it was recently upgraded and now provides you with very good frequency coverage between about 350 megahertz uh, up to 50 gigahertz, as well as the ability to process very large bandwidths. And so, for example, for conducting uh, CO deep field surveys, you now have the ability to map out simultaneously a very large volume of the universe covering a very large uh, redshift range between at least two and three and a half simultaneously. Uh, another high frequency pathfinder uh, is CHIME. This is a telescope <coughs> which has been built in Penticton, uh, Radio Astronomy Observatory, uh, northeast of Vancouver, about a four hour drive. Uh, CHIME itself uh, stands for the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment. Uh, for those cosmologists in the room, um, the H1 Intensity Mapping Experiment is basically aiming to measure the emission, the large-scale emission uh, from the H1 line, not from individual galaxies, but from large numbers of galaxies on different angular scales and as a function of frequency or redshift to measure the so-called baryon acoustic oscillation signal. So these bumps and wiggles uh, that you see in the power spectrum of the cosmic microwave background are still there today in the power spectrum of galaxies, and we can use those measurements to study the nature and evolution of dark energy. CHIME is also an excellent uh, facility for transients. In fact, it's got a pulsar uh, back end, so it will be surveys in, serving and timing for pulsars. Um, in addition, CHIME has made some discoveries of what are called fast radio bursts to add to the known population of, this, uh, of this, uh, these objects. Um, for those who work on transients, fast radio bursts have been, have been gaining a lot of attention over the last 10 years. They're effectively very short-lived bursts of radio emission, uh, maybe a millisecond in duration. There's one or two now that are repeating, uh, but they have very high dispersion measures. So that tells you about the electrons between you and the source you're looking at. The high dispersion measure means that they're likely at very large cosmological distances. And, and in fact, a few have now been confirmed to be, on, uh, be beyond uh, at least um, richest of 0 0.5. So CHIME has just discovered some new fast radio bursts. Um, and in fact, there was a BBC press release last night and I think there will be uh, at least two uh, papers coming out in the next week. Uh, and this increases the number of fast radio bursts to roughly uh, 100 and also provides an independent confirmation of their, of their existence with the new facility. Uh, finally, FAST, uh, shown here in the bottom. Uh, FAST is the largest uh, single-dish telescope now currently in operation. It's been built in Guizhou province in western China. Similar to Arecibo, FAST itself is a, a, a transit telescope. The secondary reflector is hanging uh, from cables on either side of the dish. Uh, FAST began early science about a year and a half ago now, and has already discovered new pulsars that were previously uh, unknown. So telescopes like FAST will be great. They'll complement uh, the SK-1 low surveys of pulsars in the southern hemisphere by observing those pulsars in the north uh, that we can not see uh, from the southern SK sites. So as an example, two final uh, precursors uh, to show you here. Um, I believe you had a talk on ASCAP very recently by Barbel uh, Korbalski. So I won't go into a lot of details about ASCAP itself. ASCAP is one of the precursors 
uh, that currently is in operation at uh, the Western Australia site. It consists of these single dish telescopes which are equipped with uh, what are called phased array uh, feeds. I think there's some experts in phased array feeds uh, here in the room or in the institute. Uh, the, I think of these as your wide field of view camera for low radio frequency. So giving you a much wider field of view, maybe 20 square degrees, beyond what you can get with just a single pixel feed uh, receiver. So very exciting, some already some early science results uh, coming from ASCAP, including the image shown here. Uh, this is an image of the small Ma Magellanic Cloud uh, obtained by Naomi McClure Griffiths and collaborators. And you can see all the beautiful structure in this map that was made with a small number of ASCAP antennas. And so these sort of wide field of view images are really what we expect uh, ASCAP to be, to be producing over the next few years before SK-1 mid uh, comes online. Now is a final example of one of the telescopes, uh, which is a precursor uh, for SK-1. Uh, this is Meerkat. Meerkat now consists of uh, 64 13.5 meter diameter dishes. Uh, these dishes <clears throat> are all equipped with single pixel feed receivers, very different than the technology you see used on ASCAP, which are the phased array feeds. Now, Meerkat uh, is conducting large survey programs at the end of construction, SK-1 MIDS will integrate Meerkat uh, into, its, into its array to increase uh, the collecting area. Meerkat has already produced some amazing results, uh, including the image uh, shown here. This is a Meerkat image of the galactic center at low frequency, so between about 900 and 1200 megahertz. This is predominantly showing you synchrotron emission uh, from our Milky Way galaxy. You see these big supernova remnants here to the left as well as diffuse emission, diffuse emission associated uh, with the galactic center. You also see these very strange uh, polarized type features above and below the galactic plane. I don't understand what these are doing. In fact, I understand there's still some discussion and debate as to what their origin uh, might be. But what I wanted you to take away from this is this gives us a preview for what SK-1 mid should be able to see when it begins operating uh, in South Africa with much better angular resolution as well as uh, sensitivity. So very exciting. Uh, what we'll be able to see in our own galaxy uh, using these facilities. Okay, so this brings me uh, to the SK low and mid telescopes. I'm sure uh, Lord is and Anchon, others have given you updates on what's called the baseline design for SK low and SK one mid. I'll just go through it again quickly here today. In the case of SK one low, we expect to operate between 50 and 350 megahertz using low frequency dipole antennas. The maximum separation between stations, which are about 38 meters in diameter, uh, should be around uh, 50 kilometers, which gives you around 10 to 15 arc seconds angular resolution at the frequencies uh, of interest. <coughs> in the case of MID, which will be built uh, in South Africa, we'll combine the 64 meerkat dishes with 133 uh, 15 meter diameter dishes that I'll show you here uh, in a couple of slides. Uh, these will be equipped with single pixel feed receivers operating between 35 or 350 megahertz up to about 15 gigahertz in phase one, possibly higher frequencies. And this is, again, something I'll come back to uh, on the next slide. Now, the maximum separation between mid dishes should extend up to roughly 120 kilometers, uh, providing sub-arc second angular resolution across most of the SK-1 mid observing window. This uh, slide here just shows you the current, well, the, the band definitions uh, for both mid and low. Those bands shown in bold are those bands which emerge as the highest priority uh, as put forward by the community, which should be available on day one. And so that doesn't mean the other bands won't be deployed. Similar to the case in ALMA, we'll deploy new bands as funding as well as the scientific priorities uh, dictate. One of the bands that has been designed or is being designed at, uh, and is at an advanced stage uh, is band 5C or band 6, uh, which could extend the frequency coverage up to 24 gigahertz. There's obviously a lot of scientific interest in this, but deployment of that band will depend on the funding availability, as well as the performance of the dishes up to these higher frequencies. I'll show you the dishes or prototype dishes in a couple of slides. We'll begin testing those uh, over the next uh, few months. Now, I'm sure there's no need to remind you that um, a telescope like the SK really requires collaboration on a global scale. We have now 12 full member countries of the SK organization. The three host countries, uh, South Africa, Australia, uh, and the UK, are shown here. However, we've already, even before Spain joining, we've had great contributions from the Spanish community, not only in terms of the scientific development of the science case, but also in terms of some of the design consortia, SDP, CSP, which is the back-end correlator that combines the signal 
from the different antennas, infrastructure dish, as well as SADT. So this is great. But we're obviously now very happy that Spain has formally joined uh, as a member of the SK organization. So you just beat France, I think, by a few months. So that's great. Uh, Spain is now a member of France, has also joined uh, within the last year. Now what's going to happen in the next uh, year or so is that the SK organization, which is currently set up as a private company uh, in the UK, will transition uh, to what's called an intergovernmental organization, an IGO, similar to but not identical to IGOs uh, such as CERN uh, and ESOM. Now, in order for that to happen, uh, the countries or the member countries needed to agree uh, to the text, the high-level treaty text, which was done last year. Uh, the countries have initially initialed uh, that text, or at least a subset of the company, or countries that are planning uh, to, um, to join. And we expect the ministerial signing ceremony to take place uh, within the next uh, few months. And so that's very exciting. Once that happens, then the IGO can come into existence roughly about a year after that signing takes place. So for that reason, we're in the process of, of, of planning for that transition from a private company to uh, an IGO. Now we have, um, the community has been very active in the design work of the SK. I mentioned some of the design consortia. So these are, some of these are listed here. These are effectively consortia which are, which are designing different uh, aspects of the SK, uh, SK low and mid telescopes, including the telescope manager, the signal and data transport, etc. In order for these, uh, in order for these designs to be verified, they have to go through what's called a critical design review. And so most of these have already done so, and in fact passed uh, their critical design reviews. The low frequency aperture array uh, had their design review just before Christmas. Next week, we have the Science Data Processor uh, Consortium Review in the office. So this will culminate in what's called a system critical design review toward the end of this year, which effectively ties all these pieces together to demonstrate that you have a system that can deliver the science that the community would like to see. So I just want to quickly show you a couple of highlights uh, from that design work. This is the first of two prototype dishes uh, which has been designed for SK-1 MID. Uh, this is uh, a design which has been deployed in China, it's just outside of Beijing, at the site of the company SETSI-54, which is leading uh, the design work. So this is a collaboration between SETSI-54, MTM, uh, which is the, the German company that designed uh, the ALMA dishes, as well as SK South Africa and ENAF. And you can see the design that was selected uh, is this offset Gregorian feed design that's meant to minimize the side lobe uh, noise uh, that enters into your, your primary beam as well as these, this panelized surface, which can allow you to adjust uh, the accuracy of the surface, which could potentially mean that these dishes will work up to higher frequencies. Now, a second dish uh, is now being uh, built, uh, I think this is very close to completion, at the crew site in South Africa. This has been fully funded by the Max Planck MPG group. And when completed, uh, will be used to verify both the surface accuracy as well as the pointing stability of the dishes. So that's very important, especially if you want these dishes to perform well up to high uh, frequencies. So good progress uh, being made on the side of SK-1 mid. Good progress is also being made uh, in the design of SK-1 low. Uh, this image here shows you the MWA site uh, in Western Australia. Down here in the bottom left-hand corner is what we call uh, Aperture Ray Verification System 1, which is effectively a full SK-1 low prototype station of these log periodic uh, dipole antennas. So that, uh, that station diameter sets the field of view of your instrument. We want roughly 20 square degrees as the field of view at a frequency of 110 megahertz. And the main objective of AAVS-1 is in fact to demonstrate the station beam forming and calibration uh, process. So there's still some more work to do there. I pointed that out in the last slide. Uh, we expect to deploy over the next year uh, a new set of stations, uh, again to demonstrate the beam forming and uh, station calibration procedures using these Scala 4 antennas. So the, the AVS-1 used Scala 2, which was the second generation of SK-1 low antennas. A lot of work has gone into the optimization of these low frequency antennas, uh, specifically for uh, the EOR Cosmic Dawn experiments. You can see here in pink, now the expected bandpass shape or the spectral smoothness of this Scala 4 design. And that's very important because we don't want spectral bandpass irregularities that you could misinterpret as being due uh, to the EOR 21 centimeter uh, signal you're looking uh, to detect. Uh, so great work has been done there. We're going to deploy these antennas uh, at the Western Australia site in a full or at least a half SK-1 station uh, over the next uh, few months. 
Um, for those of you interested in the expected performance of both SK1 low and SK1 mid, uh, this document can be found on our website, uh, shown here. Uh, we keep this document updated. It's a living document. Uh, we keep it updated with new information from the design work as it becomes available. Uh, and this is really important because it is a, an evolving situation. I think those of you who are at Alma know that the receivers uh, did actually perform better than what was originally expected. And so we want to make sure that we're, we're up to date with the performance estimates uh, for both mid as well as low. Another document that can be found on their website is the Science and Operations Planning document. It does mention uh, the notional aspect of key science projects. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with this, we are expecting with SK1 low and SK1 mid to allocate somewhere between 50 and 70 percent of the total observing time on these facilities to very large observing programs. Now on our website we have a KSP policy document, but in order for that to be uh, confirmed or at least approved, the IGO council or at least the proto council needs to be in place. So the final KSP policy will need to wait till then. However, there are a few principles I think that have been agreed uh, by the board. Uh, one of those being that the leadership of these large KSP programs will be restricted to astronomers at SK member countries. And so for that reason, Spain being a member puts Spain in a privileged position to lead, span, or to lead uh, large programs as well as smaller um, PI-led projects uh, going forward. Okay, so this is a, just a high-level schedule. Uh, can also be found in the previous document. Um, the allocation of key science project time will likely take place uh, before the end of construction. The idea there being giving teams enough time uh, to prepare themselves in terms of uh, gaining resources, uh, developing pipelines for their KSP experiments. Um, the KSPs themselves will not start to roughly one or two years after normal PI uh, that projects have been undertaken with the telescope. We want to better debug the system before we start devoting large amounts of time or starting these large uh, observing programs. Um, the other thing that will take place throughout construction uh, are science meetings. I'll come back to a couple of these uh, at the end of the talk, as well as what we call uh, data challenges. Now, the data challenge work is being led by Anna Banaldi, uh, one of the project scientists in the office, and she's done an excellent job in producing simulated maps of what the SK should see in the future. Specifically now, she's starting with SK-1 mid. Uh, the map she's making uh, use models for AGN and star-forming galaxies, uh, as are shown here. And in her first simulation, she's produced a series of maps that the multi-wavelength community are invited to look at and identify sources, both in terms of their positions as well as their uh, physical extent and, uh, and um, profiles. So if you're interested in participating, uh, have a look at the URL shown here. This is just the first in a series of data challenges uh, that will really be required in order not only to get the community familiar with the kind of data sets we expect to produce, but also to help us better understand what pipelines might be most effective uh, in uh, processing SK data uh, in the future. So just my final slide here. Um, we are having a series of meetings. In fact, two are, two are advertised here. Um, the next big science meeting uh, entitled New Science Enabled by New Technologies with the SK, uh, will be hosted in Jodro Bank. Uh, Lord is on the, the SOC, and I think would attest to the fact that we actually underestimated the amount of interest that would be uh, put forward by the community for this meeting. We expected something like 160 people. In the end, we had more than 300 members uh, of the community express an interest in attending. In our new uh, headquarters, we only have room for about 150 people in the auditorium, so we've had to find an alternative venue Luckily, there is one just down the road uh, at the uh, science park. We will have some of the meeting, however, still in the headquarters. And so I know that a number of you are planning to attend, and that's great. Look forward to seeing you all there toward the end of April. Another meeting that hasn't been as widely advertised yet uh, is a special session at the European Week of Astronomy and Space Science. Uh, this one-day special session <clears throat> will focus on the role of European-led surveys, both multi-wavelength multi surveys, in the way that they will influence our design choices for future uh, SK1 low uh, mid and uh, SK1 mid and low surveys. So we'll have a series of invited speakers for that, but we also encourage students, PhD students working in any of these areas, uh, who are interested in presenting to contribute uh, talks or posters, and certainly to attend uh, that special session in Lyon uh, in, at the end of June. So I'm just going to leave you there uh, now with a summary. Uh, just to highlight, there has been very good progress in the design work, and construction uh, for SK-1 made and low is now uh, on the horizon. 
Uh, since Spain is now a member of the, the SK organization, in the future, Spanish astronomers will be in a great position to lead not only smaller PI-led projects, but also uh, to manage and lead large survey programs, which will take anywhere between 50 and 70 percent of the time on these two telescopes. So it's really a great time to be preparing for the SK. And one of the best ways to do that is to use some of the pathfinders and precursors I showed you uh, previously. So thanks, everyone, uh, for your time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Renee. <clears throat> Any questions? Oh. Fast one. Yep. The place in Australia is Murchison. Murchison. Where they meet, right? Huh? Ah, it might be. I actually I don't know the answer to that, but it's it's very close to some of the mines the north of there. So for that reason, uh, it's very close. The nearest big town is Geraldton, about 200 miles to the southwest. So it's really out in the middle of nowhere. I think there's something like one milli person per square kilometer. Just to give you a feeling. In one of your first slides, you showed the uh, scientific working groups. Yep. And I was surprised to see among them uh, a group uh, doing uh, astrobiology. Can you say a few words about uh, how astrobiology comes into the SKA? So um, there is a, a group called the Cradle of Life Science Working Group, and their main areas of focus are SETI, um, the formation of planets through protoplanetary disks, as well as the study of, pre or, of organic molecules. And so by, in the original baseline design for the SK, the maximum frequency coverage was up to 3 gigahertz. And since that time, there was a lot of scientific interest in going beyond that. And so now we expect to go up to at least 15 gigahertz, which means you have access to a lot of these big molecules um, that are organic molecules. Uh, you also have the ability to image the centimeter-sized pebbles in protoplanetary disks. So these beautiful images that Alma has been making of uh, sources like HL Tau, we should be able to make similar angular resolution images of the centimeter size grains, so showing us that intermediate phase in planet formation between the millimeter-sized pebbles and the, and the planetesimals. So this is where uh, the astrobiology and cradle of life group is putting a lot of their scientific efforts. Well, just, just a comment. Well, thank you for a wonderful talk. <laughs> really a lot of, of detail on the science and I appreciate that. Uh, I just wanted to comment that, that that we find very very good and very appropriate for for the stage in which we are at the institute the data challenges. Because as you know, we we are starting uh, prototyping activities for our regional center, and apart from uh, uh, implementing uh, pipelines and doing science uh, with precursors and pathfinders of people in the institute or abroad in the community, I think that. Uh, the data challenges are very good for us at the Institute as a way to also test the things we are going to, to develop here. So I understand that uh, you are going to issue about, about one every six months or so of different kinds. Do you have any prediction on other kinds of data challenges? Because this, this is even, I don't think close to, uh, to the deadline because I expect it to be expanded, but... Uh, yeah, that's, that's I, I, I did not mention the, the regional centers. I assume that many people are familiar with this idea that the, the interface between the observatory um, and the broader community will be through the regional centers. Um, the science da data challenges, uh, what we're expecting to do uh, for the next one is to look at something similar to what's being done here, only including transient. So you have a continuum map. In it, you'll hide these variable sources, and the community will be expected to go out uh, and find those sources. I hope that following that, something like a spectral line cube data challenge will be issued. I think one of the things that we've discovered is that um, we, because of the limited resources in the office, we really require the science working groups to help us optimize these challenges. I know that the Pulsar Science Working Group have their own challenges that they run internally. The UR Working Group also have their own internal challenges. And so now, for that reason, we've just hired, we will be hiring in the next, hopefully, month a new uh, postdoc to work specifically on the data challenge aspect. And so next release will likely be transients. I'm hoping that soon after that, something like uh, spectral line images will be, uh, <coughs> will be relevant. So that it will be obviously a way for you guys to optimize uh, your, your pipelines. Yep. Uh, 
I think it's very important point to, to make clear that this is uh, multi-wavelength. It's not only for radio astronomers. So I, I keep doing this suggestion in, in the context of INEAS, the, the, the European project for uh, design in a European regional center. Uh, well, not only me, of course. But I think that uh, something that should play a role in the data challenges should be uh, something related with the virtual observatory. Because the important thing uh, about the virtual observatory is that it's something that is used by different communities at different wavelengths doing different science. So even if I'm not, if I wouldn't be a radio astronomer, I know about Topcat or Aladdin. So maybe some of these tools that are implemented to extract sources or characterize them, if they connect somehow with the virtual observatory, or that could be a challenge. The result of the previous challenge uh, to make it compatible with the virtual observatory, integrated in the virtual observatory. So that would really engage more with a community that uh, could think that's the kind of data I don't know, and I, I wouldn't know how to use. But I know Topcat, I know Aladdin, so maybe. That's a great idea. I think that's uh, back at the office. I think that, as I say, once we have this new postdoc in place, these are all th things that we could look at, absolutely. Yep, that's a good suggestion. And again, as Lord has pointed out, these data challenges are made in such a way that the data products themselves are meant to familiarize not only the radio astronomers, but the multi-wavelength community as to the kind of products they will produce. And so for this first one, you're effectively using whatever source finding algorithm you have for optical, infrared, infrared X-ray wavelengths uh, can be useful for these maps. Yeah. Thanks a lot for your talk. Uh, another question, I think, as, as you have already mentioned, something like 50 to 70 percent of the time will be devoted to KSPs at the beginning. Then, can, can you put the, the time frame for, for SKA that you have put before? In the sense, since Spain, since Spain is the staff now member, can you, I mean, the, the next April will be the third uh, big science meeting trying to define KSPs, but could you clarify when the when is the office thinking that the, the KSP should be defined and, 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 and make an invitation, in fact, to yeah. any astronomer to take part in them? No, no, I would say that in this document we proposed somewhere, I think it was the final deadline. So we proposed a deadline by which uh, groups would submit their letters of intent. And so the letters of intent would be roughly a year before the deadline. And the idea there was to, is to give the community a chance to join forces if they have similar observing strategies for different science cases. Um, what we asked the community for feedback, and the feedback they gave us was that the time that we had proposed was probably a bit too late, too close to the end of construction. Some groups would like more time to prepare, uh, you know, put their applications for funding in in order to get um, the money they need to build up their, their pipelines and, the, and their resourcing. So I think it was in the middle of 22, 2022 when the original deadline was proposed, but it's, it, it will probably be shifted earlier, so earlier in construction. I mean, another big question is whether or not, yeah, it'll probably be earlier uh, than that. So I, that's for that reason, I wouldn't give a, a final date right now, but I think it's, it can come up very quickly. We're in 2019, 2019 now. So yeah, we're, it's all approaching very quickly. And also coming back to the, the challenges that Lourdes mentioned before, I think in the next April meeting there will be a discussion of the results coming from different groups working on these data challenges. No? I think yeah. it's... Uh, I think that's to be... I think Anna would like to do the grading before the... Uh, well, before the meeting takes place so that we could announce the winners and then hopefully have a, the next data challenge ready soon after that. But I think that, that, is, that is still the objective. Questions? Okay, thanks again to Jeff and